Hello, Chem2. Today's um, lesson is on still on the ideal gas laws. Um, we'll call it part two of it, um, where we're talking about Avogadro's hypothesis, Dalton's law, and the ideal gas law. Um, last set of last part, last um, video we did dealt with a lot of these issues in red. We're going to finish those all up. Um, the video that I'll do either tomorrow or Wednesday will be all about um, incorporating the reactions. Um, there's all the administrative pieces talked about. Um, you guys are doing a really good job of getting those stoichiometry masteries taken care of. If you have not, please do that. Um, that is going to be a part of last semester's grade or last market period's grade. So I want to take care of that as soon as possible. So chapter five is all about gases. Um, we're still focusing on section two and three, the ideal gas law and laws and calculate various calculations you can do with it. This can be kind of a longer video because there are quite a few examples using these different laws. Um, so buckle up, um, pause me if you have to, um, but it's going to be quite lengthy. So to recap where we are, we've talked about Boyle's law. We've talked about Charles's law. We talked about Gilusac's law, how we were incorporating two variables at a time, pressure and volume or volume and temperature or pressure and temperature, two variables at a time while keeping the number of molecules constant. And then where we wrapped up last time was we talked about the combined gas law, where we um, incorporated three variables at once, the pressure, the volume, and the temperature all at one time. The one thing we did keep constant, one key thing we kept um, consistent was the number of molecules taking that closed container, no molecules in, no molecules out. Today we're gonna um, incorporate two and then finally, a third big law, um, the new law that you guys are already probably aware of, you just don't know it wasn't called this, is called Avogadro's Hypothesis. And we've used this in the last section in um, stoichiometry. It says equal volumes of gases under the same conditions of temperature and pressure contain the same number of molecules. What that means is if we have the same temperature and pressure, then the volume and the number of molecules are going to be directly proportional. Uh, we saw that with uh, when we did the STP number we used, that 22.4 liters per mole. It didn't matter what the molecules were. It didn't matter what the um, conditions were. Just as long as it was pressure at standard pressure and as long as it was temperature, standard temperature, then the relationship between the volume and the number of moles stayed consistent. So much like our other laws, we have Avogadro's hypothesis. We're going to incorporate this variable n. n stands for number of molecules, and we're going to use the we're going to use the number of moles. It makes it a little more convenient. So volume to number of moles is a ratio that is going to be constant. Um, again, we used this in the last chapter. We just did not call it Avogadro's hypothesis. Actually, why Avogadro got uh, recognition for Avogadro's number was he recognized this relationship. He did a lot of his work with volumes and just assumed that the volumes to the number of molecules were, um, are, are consistent. And then the last one of the laws that are like the extraneous laws is one that I'm going to refer to as one of the, one of the more obvious laws uh, that you're going to address in this unit. And it's called Dalton's law. And Dalton's law applies to mixtures of gases. Now let's see how painfully logical this is. So it says that the total pressure of a mixture of gases is going to be equal to the pressures of each gas by itself. So if you have three gases, say you have nitrogen and hydrogen and oxygen all in a vessel, and I were able to measure the volume of the pressure of the nitrogen and the pressure of the oxygen and the pressure of the hydrogen, and I were to add those all together, that'd be the same as the pressure overall. That's literally all this is. So the Dalton's law looks like this. Really pretty sad. Dalton's a really, really, really famous chemist, um, especially through atomic theory, and he gets credit for, name credit for this law. Um, pressure of total is going to be the pressure of the first gas plus the pressure of the second gas plus the pressure of the third gas. Um, when mixtures of gases are uh, in a container, you have a very multitude of different gases. Um, each one is going to have its own, what is called a partial pressure. Okay, the partial pressure is the pressure that is of the total that is the part that is represented by that particular gas. Um, you can't just have a vessel that has the oxygens over on this side and then the hydrogens over on this side and you keep them separate. They all mix together, 
but they will each individually exert their own pressure inside the container. So logic dictates the pressure of the total is the pressure of all the individual pieces um, added up. Let's look at an example of how we could use this. So um, we were supposed to do a lab associated with um, the combined gas law, and um, it would have looked something like this. It says we would collect a gas over water, which means we bubble it through water and then collect the gas. And because we collect the gas over water, that means the gas that gets collected above was going to have a little bit of water vapor in it. So if the total pressure of this hydrogen and water vapor that we were going to collect was going to be 0.965 atmospheres and the partial pressure of the water vapor was 21 millimeters of mercury, the question here was, what is the partial pressure of the hydrogen in kPa? Now, this is a combination problem where I would I want to have us do some conversions between atmospheres and millimeters of mercury and kPa to make sure everything's consistent, but also to use Dalton's law. So if I know the total pressure is 0.965 atmospheres, and since I want to get the pressure of the hydrogen in kPa, I'm going to convert that total pressure into kPa. Then I'm also going to take my water pressure, my 21.345 millimeters of mercury, and convert that into kPa. And then, simple math using Dalton's law. If Dalton's law says the partial of the pressure total is equal to pressure of the hydrogen plus the pressure of the water, and I want to know the pressure of the hydrogen, then I'm going to take my pressure total, sorry, I forgot to make that a subscript, subtract the pressure of the water, and that's going to give me the pressure of hydrogen. Do the math. Pressure total was 97.8. Pressure water was 2.84. That means my pressure of my hydrogen was 95.0 kPa. Um, just an application that allows me to use Dalton's law to separate out gases. Now, I already mentioned we had our, we're going to have our first coronavirus casualty. Um, not best use of words, but politically correct, but I'm going to say it. Um, we're missing a lab called the Molar Volume Lab, which we would have done something very similar to that, where we were going to try to confirm the molar volume of a gas. Um, if I get the time this week, I do have some video footage um, that I can put together for the demo, and I believe I collected data. So maybe I'll throw that together and show you guys what that would, was going to be all about. Um, but that was the last lab that I collected any um video footage of so we'll see what i can do with that anyway let's move on time to put it all capital a capital l capital l together putting everything together now we've already seen gas laws that incorporate pressure and volume and pressure and temperature and volume and temperature and volume and mo molecules and now we're going to incorporate all four variables into one very very sophisticated but very very useful um, gas law, and it is called the ideal gas law. Um, it is the I call it the granddaddy of all gas laws. It is the be all end all, and it is called the ideal gas law. Essentially, PV equals NRT. Um, PV equals NRT. Perfner is what how I just refer to it. PV equals NRT is kind of cool in that if we were to take the pressure times the volume. It's always going to equal the number of molecule of molecules times this R constant over T. Really, what we're looking at here is the fact that there is a relationship between PV and NT. PV over NT is always going to be a constant. That's R. As long as, as long as, as long as we have the units in the same, uh, sorry, the, the measurements in the same units. So if we use the pressure in kPa, the volume in liters, the number of molecules in moles, and the temperature in kelvins, then that R value we're going to use is going to be 8.314. However, if we find it more convenient, which we will maybe later on in the, the, the um, semester, we will use, find it much, much more convenient to use atmospheres as our pressure unit, then that, that measurement where we have pressure in atmospheres, volume in liters, number of molecules in moles and temperature in kelvins, then we're going to use 0.0821 as being our R value. It's just what this allows us to do is to interrelate. If we have three of the variables, 
we can get the fourth one. We have the volume, the number of molecules, and the temperature, we can get the pressure. We, one of the things we use a lot is if we have the pressure, the volume, and the temperature, all things are very measurable. What's the pressure of the gas? How big is the container? What's the temperature that's being held at? Then we can get the number of moles, which allows us, again, not to transition too quickly, but into stoichiometry. Let's take a look at how we can use this. Um, this comes right out of your textbook. It shows all the different variables. If you want to remember, memorize different gas law constants, 8.314 is the one I would suggest you remember most. 0.0821 or 0.8206 is for atmospheres. Um, one that gets measured, used a lot, is um, TOR. TOR is the same as millimeters mercury. I've never bothered memorizing this, but I can always just convert my units back to KPA. Um, if we use energy, which we will later on um, in this chapter, then 8.304 has the units of joules. And in the event we have to talk about molecular speed, which again is something we're last thing we're going to use. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about why this gets multiplied times a thousand. It mostly has to do with this gram thing. Um, but we have to use this value. So really right now, these two numbers are the ones you're going to memorize. 8.314 and 0.0821 as being our variables. Okay, let's take a look. Um, at standard STP, at standard temperature and pressure, when we did that, um, we were at one atmosphere, or 101.3 kilopascals, and 273, or zero degrees Celsius, was our temperature. And when we did our measurements, we had that one mole of a gas occupies a volume of 22.4 liters per mole. And we actually were going to try to prove that with the one gas law we had, but that's neither here nor there. So where did this number come from? This was apparently random number of 22.4 liters per mole. Well, realistically, if you take PV equals NRT, and since we're looking at that 22.4 liters per mole, we manipulate this equation to look like this. Now notice what I've done. I've divided both sides by P and divided both sides by N to get the N on this side in the denominator get the P on this side in the denominator also, I get a ratio of volume per number of molecule, volume per number of molecules. That number, whatever this, that's what this is, 22.4 is the number of liters in one mole. So if I put my numbers into this equation, now again, I'm going to use the 8.314 because I'm going to use kilo kilopascals for my pressure. Okay. And I've got to use my temperature being zero degrees Celsius or 273. And pressure is 101.3 kilopascals. That's standard temperature, standard pressure. If I do this math, lo and behold, I get 22.42 liters per mole. That's where that number came from. We were actually using the ideal gas law to get the value of the ratio between volumes and number of molecules at STP. Gives us 22.4 liters per mole. So when we just you were just given that number before, it did come out of this calculation to show what that was. Now we are going to be we're able to do it at any ratio, any temperature, any pressure. We can get a ratio so we can figure out how the volume and the number of molecules relate to one another. We don't have to memorize just one number. We can memorize one equation. PV equals NRT. The ideal gas law is going to help quite a bit to go between volume and number of molecules. So let's look at some examples. Suppose I have a sample of gas, um, hydrogen gas, that's at 150 milliliters, that's how big the container is, at 25 degrees Celsius and a pressure of 273 um, millimeters of mercury. Question would be, what is the mass of the gas in grams? What is the mass? So since I'm using PV equals NRT, I'm going to grab my pressure, volume, and temperature. And realize my pressure has to be converted into the appropriate units, so I'm going to convert it to KPA, making a note to myself. Even though I have this whole number, I'm going to continue to do multiplication and division on it. Um, that number ultimately came from something that had three sig figs. I'm going to change my volume over into liters, and then I'm going to change my temperature over into um, kelvins. Now again, um, I lose these 0.15 because this 25 only had to the ones place and my resultant temperature can only be to the ones place. And I am going to round that because this is an addition and I'm going to continue to use multiplication and division on that. So since I'm doing a subtraction and addition here, and this is going to use it, use it in a different um, system, then I have to round it in the middle. So let's take our numbers. Why did I say two sig figs? 
should be three sig figs. Okay, so that's three sig figs. Hopefully I did this right. We'll find out in a second. Otherwise, I'll modify it on the way. Okay, so I have pressure, volume, and temperature. I put it into the ideal gas law. Make my ideal gas law PV equals NOT and solve for N dividing both sides by R and T. I get that I have my numbers, my pressure, my volume, my R, my temperature. Do the math. I get 5.93 times 10 to the negative second moles. The question asks for grams. So then I would use my stoichiometry to multiply times the molar mass of hydrogen gas, H2, from Brinkelhoff. So I have 0 0.0120 grams of gas in that container um, that was at 150 mils, 25 degrees Celsius, and 273, 273, <laughs> 735 millimeters of mercury. Okay. So get another example. It says, suppose I, ha I put in a certain number of grams of gas into a container of a certain size and at a certain temperature, what would be the pressure? And I want to put the pressure in KPA. That makes it kind of easy because what I'm going to do is change my volume, my temperature, and my mass. My volume, I'm going to convert over to liters. My temperature, I'm going to convert over to kelvins. And my mass, I'm going to convert that over to moles by using the, atom the molar mass of the gas, which is oxygen, O2, um, 31.9988. Then I'm going to put it into the ideal gas law. It's asking me for the pressure, so I'm going to divide both sides by V. And when I put my numbers in, the 0 0.090619, using the appropriate R value, 8.314, using the temperature and the volume, I get that I have a pressure of 304 kilopascals in that container. That's pretty good. That's three times the um, atmospheric pressure. Okay, and then one more problem, actually two more uh, problems. Sulfur hexafluoride is a gas that's used as a long-term um, plug for a retinal hole to repair and detach the eye. Um, if I have 1.50 grams of this compound in the container at a certain temperature, what's the pressure in atmospheres? This time asking you to do it in atmospheres. So strategy that your book employs is, like we just did, change your milliliters over liters, change the Celsius over Kelvins, and then use the appropriate R value as need be. So I'm going to change my units. My volume, I'm going to change over to liters. My temperature, I'm going to change over to kelvins. My molecule, the grams, I'm going to change over to moles. And since P is NRT over V, like we used in the last example, I plug in those numbers using the appropriate R value. This time I'm using, since they asked for it in atmospheres, using the appropriate R value of 0.0821. Um, then I'm going to get a pressure of one atmosphere. Okay, so last concept that's associated with these two sections is the concept of density. Okay, as you might well be aware, and if you think about it like the, the visual that I've been using for the different um, examples so far, we talked about balloons. Balloons will rise based on their density. Your density indicates whether something's going to float or sink. And helium and hydrogen balloons um, will have a tendency to rise because their gas is very, very low in density, much lower than air. So density, when talking about any density, whether it be a liquid, solid gas, is the same thing. It's a ratio between mass and volume, mass and volume, and that's the ratio between the two. Um, the molar mass um, that we're going to use has a... a units of grams per mole, and we know the ideal gas law. So there is a relationship between molar mass of a gas and density. I want to show you how that comes about. So ideal gas law, PV equals NRT. Molar mass is a mass per mole. Molar mass is, we're going to use the, the symbol MM for molar mass. Molar mass is the mass per mole ratio, and density is a mass per volume ratio. So if I take and I manipulate this molar mass measurement, mass per mole, molar mass, moles is mass per molar mass, moles is mass per molar mass. I'm just basically divided both sides by molar mass and multiplies both sides by moles. And I were to put that into the ideal gas law, again, comparing the ideal gas law to be volume is moles, NRT over P. 
I'm going to get a relationship that's going to allow me to see that there is a comparison that PV mass per molar mass, mass per molar mass, mass per molar mass was moles, PV equals mass per molar mass is moles, then density, which is mass per volume, mass per volume, is going to be molar mass times pressure divided by RT, or another way to look at it is your density is going to depend on three things. What's the pressure? What's the temperature? And what gas do you have in the container? Another way to look at it is this allows me to calculate the molar mass if I have the density, the R value, the appropriate R value to go with all the whatever P you use and temperature. T temperature always has to be Kelvin. This is if I want to figure out the density, it's molar mass times P over RT. Um, these two equations don't necessarily need to be memorized if you understand that the relationship between for density is mass per mole. So you can just get the mass and get the mass per mole is mass per volume. Um, you can get, get the mass and get the volume and do that relationship. And knowing that molar mass is um, mass per mole, um, get the mass, get the moles. Um, it doesn't really matter, but these are two shortcuts to get between the two. Um, there's one of your examples of different balloons and the pictures that I've used for our um, screenshots. Okay, so final problem. It's a long one, but it goes to show you all the, the cool stuff we can do with these gas laws. So acetone, the gas, has a density of 1.696 grams per liter at 95 degrees Celsius. That's pretty warm, okay? And at 1.02 atmospheres. Going to ask three questions in succession. First question, how many moles of acetone are in the container? Second, what is the molar mass of acetone? And finally, for the last question, we're going to incorporate something we did in the last chapter. It says acetone in this situation has three elements, carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. This should look familiar. It's a combustion reaction. When 1.00 grams of acetone is burned, 2.27 grams of carbon dioxide and 0.9 Three two grams of water are for, formed, and it's going to ask for what is the molecular formula, molecular formula, not empirical formula, but molecular formula of acetone. Um, obviously, in part B, we're going to get the molar mass, so we you know we need molar mass in order to get molecular formula. Let's do it in succession. First one question says how many moles of acetone are in the one liter flask? Um, so if we know that we have a one liter flask. We know the temperature is 95 degrees Celsius, or 368 kelvins, and we know the density. Um, we also know the 1.96 grams, so you, it asks for the number of moles of acetone. So if I know the grams, I know the grams. Um, I know, the, sorry, I know the moles. I have PV pressure was in atmospheres. Volume was in liters. R is a 0.0821. Temperature is in kelvins. I do the math. I find out that I had a whopping 0 0.0338 moles based on the pressure, volume, and temperature the gas was contained at. Second question says, what's the molar mass? Well, molar mass is a relationship for between grams and moles. So all we're going to do there is divide the grams, 1.96, divided by the molar, the moles, 0.0. 338 that we just got in the previous example to find out that our molar mass is 58 grams per mole. Final question, the one that takes a little bit of time or would take a little bit of time. Acetone contains three elements. Okay, so now I take that one gram of acetone, I burn it, I get a certain number of carbon dioxide and a certain amount of water. Question is, what is the molecular formula? So the first thing we need to do is get the empirical formula like we've done before. So we're going to convert the mass of the products into the mass of each element, get the simplest formula, the empirical formula, and then we can compare the simplest formula to the molar mass and see what do we have to multiply through by. So let's talk about each of the elements. Carbon had 2.27 grams of carbon at 12 grams of carbon for every 44 grams of carbon dioxide. They give you 0.619 grams of carbon. For hydrogen, 0.6932 grams of water at two times the hydrogen's molar mass because there's two hydrogens in an H2O. Then I got 0.104 grams of 
of um, hydrogen. And then finally get the mass of oxygen. I'm going to figure out the number of grams I have subtracted from the one gram total, and I got 0.277 grams of oxygen. I now need to convert all those into moles. So for carbon, I'm going to divide by the atomic mass of carbon. For hydrogen, the atomic mass of hydrogen. Oxygen divided by the atomic mass of oxygen, and I get 0.07, 0.1, and 0.013. In order to get the simplest ratio, I divide by the smallest, which is 0 0.017, and I get a 3 to 6 to 1 simplest ratio, 3 to 6 to 1. And that would be my simplest formula. Then my molar mass of the simplest formula is 58, which we found out was the molar mass of our vapor was 58. So therefore, my simplest formula is my molecular formula. The number that I get of C3H6O is the molecular formula of acetone. Acetone is, has the empirical formula and the molecular formula of C3H6O. So that's the end of that video. Next, time, next one, like I said, it'll probably be either tomorrow or Wednesday. I'll put something together. Um, it will be the big daddy. It will be bringing it all together um, where we're going to have stoichiometry, meet gas laws. That's my title for it. Um, I use a, a concept of Godzilla meets Mothra. You have the beast that is stoichiometry, all the fun that we, we dealt with in stoichiometry and aqueous stoichiometry and all that we could do there. Well, now we're going to incorporate gas laws. We're going to throw out the window that 22.4 liters per mole and use PV equals NRT in order to get between pressure and volume. Hopefully everyone is being safe, healthy, and is practicing their um, social distancing I miss you all guys. Um, hopefully we'll see each other before the end of the school year. Um, as much as it might be really, really fun to do these videos on a regular basis and this be our method of learning. I miss seeing you guys. Uh, I want to get back in school as soon as possible. But until then, always remember and never forget, you know, sick figs do matter. Have a good day.